like a challenge. Some more than others. In this show, we bow down to the pros who put their life on the line for a living. You're a freaking Superman. It's just amazing. And we salute the Have A Go heroes. Amateurs pulling off Hollywood stunts on backstreet budgets. If there's a record to be broken, these guys will smash it. Or smash themselves trying. If you don't have proper training and do these stunts, you die. Offering up method to this madness are the scientists. And there's no margin for error. It's utterly disastrous. Giving us the lowdown on the physics of fast and the biology of bizarre. Everybody was really scared, really scared. So sit back as we witness the jaw dropping, the heart stopping, and the eye popping in Stunt Science. Coming up in today's show, how teamwork makes the dream work. How not to lose your head when faced with danger. Defying the rules of gravity and ignoring the rules of gravity. Ooh, yeah. But first... The sea. A storm. And a bloke with a kite freaking out tourists on Brighton Pier. Meet four times British kite surfing champ, Lewis Crathern. What I love and the thing which gets me really excited is the storm wind conditions, over 60 miles an hour. The stronger the wind, the higher you go. There's so much power when you jump, it's like being shot out of a cannon. This extreme sport doesn't come without risks, as Lewis knows all too well. I landed backwards. So I actually knocked myself out. I pretty much drowned. 60% of my lungs were filled with water and I was placed into a coma for a week, but I can't get over the exhilarating feeling of the extreme conditions, so I've almost forgotten about it. It's strange how that can happen. Stranger still is that Lewis took that as his cue to plan the biggest stunt he'd ever attempted. He wanted to jump one of the UK's most famous coastal landmarks, Brighton Pier, which measures over 15 metres high. I basically thought, in my lifetime, someone's going to do that. It has to be me. So to avoid injuring himself and the unsuspecting tourists, Lewis has a lot to consider. I think Lewis is absolutely insane. There are so many factors he needs to have right here. He needs a high tide. He needs super big waves to give him a good jumping off point. Uh, but most important of all is going to be the wind speed and the wind direction. It's got to be incredibly strong in order to lift him up. And it's got to be blowing in the right direction as well to take him over the pier and not out to sea or into the beach. It's just getting that height at the crucial time. The worst case scenario was I could die. With so much riding on him nailing this jump, Lewis waited patiently for Mother Nature to play ball. I waited a year for the perfect conditions, and they needed to be 100 out of 100 perfect. So after about a year, a storm showed up on the radar. I tracked it all the way across the Atlantic. I could see that it was meant to hit Brighton perfectly on the right day, the right time. I was so ready for it. On the morning, I woke up feeling a bit nervous. I knew it was a big day, but it didn't actually go to plan as I expected. I wasn't getting even in line with the pier. It was dangerous. I was underpowered. It was devastating. As the storm raged on, time was running out. The tide was actually dropping. I had to get on with it as quick as possible. There was one thing going through my mind. Do not lose your edge. I could not lose my board or it would be over. If I lost my grip and span off, I would have just span off and smashed into the bottom of the pier. It wasn't an option. I really did get the last wave of the day. And that one wave gave me the chance. And I went for it. <laughs> I 
coming over that pier was uh, an amazing feeling. That was a very important moment and possibly the most incredible couple of seconds of my life. Lewis battled the storm to make history. The only man to have jumped right and beer. One to tell the grandkids, hey Lewis. But he's not the only gutsy sportsman upping the ante. World record football freestyler John is taking his tricks from the field to this 183 metre pylon. That's double the height of the Statue of Liberty. Playing keepy uppy this high requires serious balls. Well, one of them at least. John could give Ronaldo a lesson in finely balanced footy skills. And talking of balance, this roller skater is raising the stakes by performing her own high-rise tricks. If you've ever tried to master the moonwalk on a night out, she's going to put you to shame. This girl's up in the ante by bunny hopping on a unicycle, blindfolded with a flaming skipping rope. Standard! They're also playing with fire in Serbia. 27-year-old Nemanja didn't get cold feet dribbling this great ball of fire. He shoots, he scores. But that's an easy shot compared to this fast and furious baller in California. With his right hand playing a game of basketball and his left driving a car. Basketball rules state you're not allowed to take a shot when you're moving, but we'll let this one go. What do you do if you can't find your bottle opener? Keen golfer Joshua has enlisted his wife to help pop the champagne with this unique trick shot. That was one way to get a drink. Bottoms up. This is a DIY project that your mates can get on board with. Meet Clint Walker. A keen skateboarder with big ideas. Well, I was always, you know, pretty like hands-on and just like building with whatever you had, you know, out in the barn, whatever. His hair's grown out, but he hasn't grown up since his glorious homemade project. We built a slip and slide loop, a um, big 12-foot slip and slide loop for no other reason rather than just because we wanted to. Seems like as good a reason as any. So he roped his dad and best friend Clive in to build it. It's funny, everybody thinks we're like the biggest rednecks. Attached to the roof just under five metres in the air and smothered with peanut oil to make it extra slippy. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, speed is key in getting around the loop. I would say probably about 25. I'm not a scientist, but yeah, 25 miles an hour. Clint's not a scientist, but Russell is. The key to this stunt is speed and they need to go as fast as they possibly can so they don't go halfway up and land in a really painful way. So they're doing the right thing so far. They're lying flat like you would in a water slide. They've coated the whole of the slide in peanut oil to make sure it's as frictionless as possible. Unfortunately, they live in a bungalow. They don't really have that height to give them the speed that they're gonna need to go all the way around. So I'm kind of guessing they're gonna go halfway around it, get to the top point and just land in an uncomfortable mess at the bottom. So with the loop lubed and ready to go, it's showtime. And being the gent he is, he's letting his mate Clive go first. It's gonna be scary. Now that's gonna sting. Clive kind of ran and jumped into it, and as soon as he jumped into it, I was like, oh, dude. He needed a lot more speed to make it all the way around. And instead of sliding up and coming straight back down, he went straight 12 o'clock and then just fell straight from the top right back down onto the track, all like the plywood, you know, tracks that was below him. 
he split like a pretty big L on his foot, like definitely needed stitches and uh, told him that he shouldn't go to the doctor when he definitely should have. We advised him not to and then it got infected. So Clive was bummed on that for a while. Who needs a doctor when you've got Clint on hand? We super glued him up and then after we super glued him up, we went back out and then uh, yeah, I slung my, my body around that thing, I guess. With the dummy run done, it's Clint's turn. And to give him more speed, he decides to cling onto a stretched out bungee rope. Good luck, mate. I actually didn't go fast enough and I went around to, I don't know, like three o'clock or something. And then I actually fall like a couple feet on back into the track. Down, but not out. Clint had another idea. So yeah, we attached a bungee to a truck and let it sling us through the loop. Hey, I didn't say it was a good idea. We knew we weren't gonna be able to have enough speed just coming off the roof because the loop was big and it wasn't gonna work just with our own momentum from the top of the house. So we knew we were gonna have to have something to be slinging us into it. So with added bungee power, it was time for Clint to take the hot seat. Yeah, sitting up there was pretty, uh, pretty scary actually. There was no turning back at that point. I just didn't want to fall from the top down onto the wood, and that was the biggest fear. I just wanted to go fast. I just want to go fast, man. Brilliant! We knew you'd do it, Clint. Honest. Stuck to the loop the whole way around, and um, yeah. Made it, and you can tell in the video, we were so hyped. It was like, it felt like landing a skateboard trick, you know? It was like, ah, oh, like, we did it, we looped! Like, I don't know, it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah, we looped! It was definitely a, definitely a rad feeling, and uh, I don't know, yeah, I won't forget that. And now the video's gone viral and attracted eight million views. It's definitely earned its place in the Stupid Stunts archives. I'm stoked that uh, everybody enjoyed it. I'm stoked that everybody made it out all right. Clive's all good, I'm all good. So, I don't know, keep, keep doing dumb stuff. It pays off. Don't listen to him, lads. This is the guy who super glued an open wound. And he's not the only one laughing in the face of health and safety. Life's tough in the city, but these guys have made it even harder. Daredevil Vittorio, a freestyle biker from Italy, has taken his bike skills to a whole new level. Yup, on top of a Ferris wheel. One wrong move, and it's a 65 metre drop. Mate, you need a parachute, not a helmet. If that one had your heart racing, you'd better brace yourself. Russian Oleg has gained quite the following with his vertigo-inducing videos. Although I can't say I'd be surprised if, but whoa, one day the uploads just stop coming. Viral wannabes just keep on upping the stakes. Take this base jumper who climbed up this rusty health hazard of a building. I hope he got his tetanus jab. Well, it's one way of seeing the city. And here's another. Urban explorer Ricky couldn't find an open-top bus tour in Paris, so he's attempting his own. Clinging onto a roof in the cold at 48 kilometers an hour is a stupid thing to do. Plus, it doesn't look much like fun either. And he's turning his talents into a European tour. Back in Blighty, Ricky's lost his travel card. If risking life and live on a bus wasn't extremely dangerous enough, this time he's train surfing with a twist. It's advised not to try and avoid the ticket inspector in this way. You may end up with more than just a heavy fine. You can usually bet if something's happening in England, it's what they do for breakfast in Russia. No, they've not brought back third-class travel. Meet Batgirl. She thinks that this is a good idea.
but let me assure you, it isn't and should never be attempted. She's only spitting distance from those high voltage cables, but thankfully, the next stop is Gotham City. The deadly craze continues with these lads across town. The first step is to get on the train unnoticed. Nothing to see here, officers. Next is to avoid getting your head chopped off. Wearing goggles was a great idea, but I've got a better one. Buy a ticket and travel inside the train. Next up, a prime example of how some stunts are destined to fail. Meet JJ Allen. He's the ringleader of POR, the world's most dangerous stunt group. Nothing compares to the rush I get when I'm about to do something crazy that should mess me up and I end up standing up and walking away from it. That is the biggest rush that I will ever get in my life and I keep coming back. You know, I keep wanting more and more and more. POR stands for Profits of Regret, and their mission is to push the boundaries of extreme stunts. One goal in mind to produce the most edgy content we could possibly create, and uh, this is what we want to do going forward until our bodies won't allow it anymore, until, you know, Father Time kicks us. <laughs> Self-inflicted pain is their forte. From setting themselves on fire and jumping from extreme heights, to cracking themselves in the nuts. The gnarlier the stunt, the better. People come up to me all the time, and they're just like, wow, why did you do that? Over the years, a lot of our crew members have broken bones, we've had third degree burns, but broken bones come with the territory, stitches come with the territory. The shock value, the shock content, that's what I like. But even though JJ is the mastermind with the shocking ideas, he devised one stunt even he wouldn't attempt. So fellow members Pinhead Larry and Goose Egg Bub stepped up to the plate. Pretty much the basic idea behind the canoe over the car stunt was for them to fly through the air in the canoe and hopefully land. Hopefully being the key word there. We wanted to make sure that they cleared the car, so the truck that pulled the canoe had to go super fast. JJ's confident. Let's see if Stacy thinks his science checks out. They're in a canoe with a uh, curved bottom, so it's bound to flip over. So the key to the stunt is damage limitation. So to avoid serious physical trauma, they need to employ the brace position, and this will protect their head and their internal organs from injury. By keeping their arms and legs tucked in, they're gonna prevent themselves from breaking bones. They'll land in the wrong place, and they'll face a world of pain. With a vote of confidence from Stacy there, it's time to get this show on the road. All of us were super nervous. I think everybody in the group was nervous except Bud and Pinhead. They're, they seem to be the most calm out of all of us. Hey guys, don't smoke. It's bad for your health. <laughs> then again, so is canoeing over stationary cars. And that doesn't look like the brace position. There was no plan for it at all. Pretty much, I, I put a, a motocross helmet on. Uh, he put his helmet on. Next thing you know, I'm sitting in the canoe with him and flying towards that ramp. I was so nervous, and when I actually saw them land, they landed so violently, and I thought for sure that they landed on their heads from my vantage point, because I had a bird's eye view. The canoe was upside down. After the canoe hit the ground, I hopped right back up, so nobody really thought too much of me being hurt. Uh, the camera instantly focuses on Bub laying on the ground. He's kind of groaning. Bub, you all right? Bub. Oh, yeah. He walks away with bumps and you know, scrapes. They finally get back to me, and you can see a hand is clearly disfigured, popped out of place. Pretty good. Can you move your fist? Can you take a fast cat? Almost completely shattered a bone in here. I was screw in there. I had to have six kids put in, so I didn't move around. I was in cast for about six months. I regained some flexibility back to it. I have permanent arthritis for the rest of my life. 
Ah, limited wrist action for life. You'll need to get a new hobby. So was it time to jack in the jackassing? I feel it's worth it. I'm still back out here, and I'm still doing stuff. Well, you know what they say. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. Maybe that doesn't apply to stunts. In Montana, this fella has built his first ski jump. And I'm guessing that it was also his last ski jump. Snow, meet face. Face, this is snow. With a run up this long, you just know this have a go hero is going to hurt himself. Yup. I think everyone in the room felt that one. If you want to impress the ladies, then don't do this. Style it out, mate. Maybe they didn't notice. This paraglider is coming in way too hot, so he's aiming for a water landing. He's fudged the splashdown, but he does get a soft landing on his undercarriage. My balls on the water. <laughs> Pour one out for a fallen homie, as he's left one cog short of a gearbox. <laughs> Sometimes these stunts sound better on paper, like a bike on a rope swing. This cut price Evil Knievel hasn't convinced himself this is a good idea. Yeah. You're kind of stalling. You can only put it off for so long, mate. It's time to show us those sweet moves. There he goes, he's ready. Show time. <laughs> or not. Gravity really had it out for that guy. Who says you need snow for a ski jump? This young fella in Slovenia is doing just fine with a bit of tarpaulin. I'll give him five points for bravery, naff all for style. Stand by for an epic fail. 3,650 metres up is no place for a cock-up. But skydiver Darren has misheard instructions to wait and jumped with his restraint cable still attached. Dangling from a plane over three kilometres up. If Daz is an adrenaline junkie, then this is an overdose. Thankfully, the instructor sets him free. See you, mate. What a wallet. He said it. Next up, a professional thrill seeker who'll go to great heights for a scenic view. The man behind this stomach churning setup is Samuel Valeri. When I started highlining, it was considered rather a crazy thing to do. More than your average stroll, highlining involves walking on a springy band of rope suspended high above ground. I do some rather extreme action on highlines. Yeah, just try pushing the limits in this sport. And Samuel was pushing the limits pretty far when he dreamt up his latest stunt. Highline between two cable cars is definitely a stunt that shouldn't be done by anybody. It's definitely more difficult than normal highlining. The scene of this scary looking stunt was the Swiss Alps. Samuel's plan was to stroll between two wobbly cable cars a hundred meters above the ground. Sounds simple, but let's let science be the judge. It's really important that Samuel gets the tension in the slack line just right. If it's too tight, there won't be any give when he steps onto it, which would make things harder. If it's too loose, it could wobble around too much and he might lose his balance. It's also really difficult because it's on a slant. Now, when he steps onto it, gravity is going to be pulling him down and that actually changes the angle of the slack line. And as he moves further along it, closer to that second cable car, the angle in front of him is going to get steeper and steeper, making it even harder for him to manage to climb it. Normally, when you're slacklining, you attach the line to two fixed points. But in this case, it's attached to cable cars which can move. 
A strong gust of wind could completely destabilize the system, making it so wobbly that he's in danger of falling off. So as the day of the stunt approached, the pressure was on. We had to wait until closing time of the cable cars, so we didn't have a lot of time for rigging, doing the stunt and de-rigging. And with an added time limit, Samuel had to get it right. When it was about time to mount the highline, I was becoming quite nervous. And normally mounting highlines doesn't make me nervous. I just knew I will feel new things, so I started shaking a bit. It's always impressive to just see like 100 meter of nothingness below you. And yeah, it, it makes me nervous. Consider what'll happen if that harness falls, mate, and you'll feel a lot more than nervous. When I tried to stand up, I, I had a lot of goosebumps. It was kind of a scary moment, even though I knew I was secured. It feels so exposed and everything is moving. So that gave me a, a much more intense feeling. I tried first, of course, walking. That's always the, the first thing you do on Highline. But then I started surfing to the side. I try to, to push the, the Highline to the side as much as I possibly can. Whoa there, Sam. A hundred meters up is no place for showing off, is it? After walking the line a few times, I thought like, now it's time to challenge my limits. I tried to go for the most difficult trick that I can perform on Highlands at the moment, which is the handstand. I didn't know how to, how to hold balance on my hands on this line because the oscillations were much more powerful than normally. Fighting strong winds and moving cable cars, Samuel struggling. But after a few tries, I figured out how to press myself up into handstand. I couldn't do many tries because after 10 or 15 tries, I was so exhausted that I had to, to stop the whole thing. You've earned a break, Samuel, and the queues at the cable car stations must be epic. While Samuel prefers to hit heights all on his own, there are plenty of activities which are much more fun when you double up. Queensland, Australia. This couple is well past the Netflix and chill. They're fooling for each other big time. 26-year-old Bella and her boyfriend Lee are performing their hair-raising trapeze stunts, a whopping 4,260 meters above the ground. It would be a very messy breakup if things went wrong. Beautiful. Our next double act is a couple on the rocks. They say a couple that play together stay together, but for 20-somethings Jacob and Bron, it's more the couple that climbs together. This pair of swingers met at a rock climbing club at university. See, it's not all dating apps nowadays. Since hooking up, they've highlined, skydived, bungee jumped and cliff jumped. What's wrong with dinner and a movie, eh? Our next couple's love knows no heights. Angela and Alexander figure that a 120 meter high crane is the perfect spot for a romantic photo. Smile. If you think it looks extremely dangerous, you'd be right. But don't worry, seems the force is strong with this one. Now here's a supportive boyfriend, Way. When he asked if she wanted to hang out tonight, she didn't have this in mind. These Americans have no trouble on their trapeze and, as with all good love stories, ends with a kiss. Ah. Couples yoga. This can be an amazing way to get closer to your partner. <laughs> Maybe too close. Are you okay? <laughs> Are you okay? Yep, nothing that six months of physio can't sort. To pull off advanced tandem yoga moves, you need balance, core strength, and to really like your partner. <laughs> I've only heard of the downward facing dog. No idea what you call this.
Our last daring duo is this power couple from the States. This geezer's upper body strength and balance is keeping his partner out the drink. He'd make an awesome waiter. Garçon, uno surf bait, por favor. Stunts like these are best left to muscle-bound pros. But there's still plenty of cool stuff that you can try out yourself. We're going to show you the tips and tricks to the deceptively difficult art of stone skimming. The perfect way to annoy fishermen, this is Stunt Hacks. Stone skimming is actually more science than art. Our main man, Taran, is here to tell us what stops the stone sinking like a, well, stone. Well, in order for the stone to bounce, it needs to hit the water at a particular angle, which is roughly 20 degrees. Surely the angle changes when it hits the drink. Well, the stone stays at this special angle because of gyroscopic inertia. Gyroscopic what? Uh, you have to give it angular momentum. Pardon? Basically, you have to spin it. Wasn't too hard, was it? The best tip is to flick your wrist to generate the spin. This will keep the stone on course and help it skip off the water. That's the science. And who better to put the theory into practice than Gareth Twamley? Gaz came in fifth at the Stone Skimming World Championships. And yes, apparently that is a thing. The ideal weather conditions for stone skimming are perfectly still, perfectly tranquil, uh, sunny, like we almost never have here in Wales. So first tip, emigrate. But if we did want to punt, what kind of stone are we looking for? Uh, the perfect stone for skimming will be three to four inches across, nice and flat, but with a decent weight. And for myself, I like to have a small notch on the edge that I can hook my finger around and generate the spin. So there you have it. Some surefire ways to skip stones like a pro. But there's not much we can do about the weather in Wales. Sorry, Gareth. This woman reckons she can pick up any man. Now, I'm not saying I'm choosy, but... Oh! People ask me what I do for a living and I tell them I am a strong lady. First reaction is most of the time that they will look me up and down and say, well, you don't look that strong. And my reaction to that is normally a little wink and a laugh and say, wait till you see what I do. <laughs> Meet Betty Braun, who tours the world with her powerful one-woman show. I've been performing this show for over a decade now, and at the beginning, people were really, like, they were so surprised by it. Betty enthralls her audience with her incredible acts of strength. She rips thick books apart with her bare hands, twists solid metal, and snaps steel chains. There's one part of her show that really gets the crowd going. During my Strong Lady shows, I mainly lift men out of the audience. That's a novel approach to picking up blokes. I think it's quite unusual to see women lifting men. That's the key part of the show. It's the bit that I love the most. Job satisfaction is so important. But Betty isn't satisfied with just one fella. She'll also go twos up. My signature stunt is the human carousel. Basically, I have a metal bar and a swing on either side, and I get the men to hold on, and then they sit into the swing, and I pick them up and spin around. Even after everything I've done in the show up to that point, a lot of people still can't quite believe that I'm actually going to do it. And when I do, there is this, like, little ripple of shock that goes out through the audience. Yeah, I promise I don't break him, OK? <laughs> Thank you. And with all eyes on Betty, she definitely doesn't want to mess it up. There's always this little moment just before I do it where I'm like, what if it goes wrong? Because sometimes the people that I'm lifting in shows are well over 100 kilos. The worst thing that could happen is that one of them sits really fast and the other one doesn't sit. Or sometimes it happens that they sit not quite at the same time and that's all right, but the further it gets out of sync, the more risk there is to my back or the risk of the whole thing hitting the deck if I was leant too far forward or too far back. If you go in shaky, it's not going to work. So how does Betty lift two grown men, swing them about and not break her back? For the human carousel to be absolutely perfect, the main things that I have to think about are the men are the same size and weight, 
Physically, that's the main thing. And then also the alignment of my own body. If I can have the weight perfectly distributed over the center of my feet, it doesn't so much matter how heavy they are, as long as they're kind of the same as each other, because I can inch myself closer to whoever's heaviest, so I can adjust for it a little bit. For me, the, the easiest is if they're both tall and the same weight, because the taller they are, the less deep my squat has to be to lift them up but I just have to click my core into engagement. I have to just click my mind in and be like, I know what to do. I've done the training, I trust it. I trust these guys and you go in and you do it. Anyone else watching this thinking they need to join a gym? We've already clocked these thrill-seeking freaks and fools, putting their necks and knackers on the line. But to walk away from an outrageous stunt with your crown jewels in one piece, yeah, you need to do it like a boss. Gold medalist Sicily is making me feel a bit dizzy. The dive is not for the faint-hearted with its 16-metre drop. Cool. I think I'll need a towel too. And what do you do if you ask your boss if you can work from home? But really, you're off on a wakeboarding trip. Some people can't handle a desk job. But when you're under it at work, you can end up drowning in admin. I'm sure he was just mucking about on Facebook anyway. But these lads in British Columbia have got their work-life balance down. When Hank asked his mate if he could crash on his couch, this wasn't the kind of sofa surfing he had in mind. With a beer in hand, Hank's like any other couch potato. But the view of the telly is rubbish. Next up, it's the king of the swingers. Yes! Yes! He might smash this trick like a boss, but I'm sure it took a couple times to get right. Yes! Yes! Yeah! And I'm sure this trick has a couple of outtakes. Ah! What a shot! It doesn't matter if you've been at it all day. It's all worth it for that one moment. <laughs> this guy is the only person in the world to have done this. If you thought that grown men riding on kiddie scooters looked ridiculous, then you haven't met Dakota Schwartz. I've won four world championships, two Guinness World Book of Records, so just for most backflips in a minute. If I counted maybe upwards of 50 or 60, like, pro competition wins. There's no denying he's proper good on a scooter. That's what happens when you practice hours a day for over a decade. What really started me on scootering was just how new it was. And when, like, I started, there was nothing. Like, I couldn't go type in how to backflip, how to flare, whatever. At the time, there was barely any tricks, so whatever we did was probably the first in the world. So that, that's what really drove me. Dakota's been pioneering new tricks in the sport for years and was the first to pull off a front flare on a scooter. And now he's got his sights set on the seemingly impossible. He's aiming to pull off the most mid-air kicklesses. It's called the Quinn Kickless. The kickless is basically when the scooter goes one direction and then you pull it back with no kicking or anything. All you do is pull it with your force. It's pretty hard to do it in one air. Dakota is aiming to pull off the Quint kickless. Yup, five of these mid-air mashups. And to nail this, he needs the right setup. The ramp required for me to do a Quint kickless is a mega ramp. Basically, the gap is 45 feet. The drop-in is 50 feet. So as long as you drop in the 50-foot roll-in, you should have enough speed to make the gap. Should, but there's no guaranteeing, eh, Dakota? 
This stunt to Dakotas, it's, it's a massive trade-off from start to finish because he wants to go really fast. The faster he goes, the longer he's in the air. But on a little scooter with two-inch wheels of 40 miles an hour, they're already spinning at 8,500 RPM and he's got to try and balance it. That's a compromise. The next thing, board length. The longer the board, the more stable he is on the way down, but the more difficult it is in the air because longer is exponentially harder to flick from side to side. It's really, I'd say there's probably about five or 10 big classical physics equations he's got to solve somewhere between the top of the ramp and the moment he lands. Did you get that, Dakota? So the lighter the scooter, the better it is for me to whip it around because it's less effort. So my scooter weighs 2.7 kilos, but the wheelbase is the most important, so we try to make them as short as possible so our feet can get on, but also whip it really fast. Easy ride or not, jumping a 13-meter gap from a 15-meter drop-in is a mammoth task. And there ain't no safety net. Anything can go wrong, because obviously 50 feet drop, that's, that's a lot of case for error. And if a gust of wind hits you, you've got to position yourself how to fall with what, however high you are, and then you've got to try to slide and not break any bones and stuff like that. The ramp's not that wide. It's maybe like eight feet wide at the most, but at that speed, it seems so small. So if you go like a couple inches to the right and you shoot off that way, you're going 40 feet to flat, and that's, uh, that couldn't end well in any case. Dakota's decided to showcase his big stunt on the world stage in front of a crowd of 25,000 people. No pressure then. So I'm starting out on a 50-foot roll-in. You probably hit around 40 miles an hour, maybe even faster. When I was there that day, I didn't think it was possible. And then I went. Once I'm in there, the main thing to focus on is to stay straight. As you kick it, you bring it to the left, back, 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 five times. Blink and you'll miss it. But Dakota smashes it and lands the world's first ever Quinn Kickless. Being in there for four seconds, it, it seems like a long time, but your mind kind of slows down. I couldn't believe I landed it, so it was definitely pretty cool. And the crowd thought the same, and nobody's ever seen it. I didn't think it was possible. Nobody thought it was possible has like five kicklesses in one air in such a short amount of time, it's a lot of uh, things that shouldn't happen. And so when I landed it, I think a lot of people thought it was really crazy and groundbreaking in the scooter world. Nice one, Dakota. You knocked it out of the park. Right, we've seen a bloke blown away by a kite. The laws of gravity well and truly broken and countless other ways to put yourself and your mates in hospital. But that's enough stunt science for now. So until next time, sling your hook. Go on, do one.